Good morning and welcome to Jew in the City Speaks with your host, Allison Josephs, also known as Jew in the City. We do a lot of complaining around here and not to, you know, uh, further the Jewish stereotype of the complaining Jew, but um, being an organization that has been noticing the negative representation about Orthodox Jews in our founding mission, and then negative representation of Jews in general with the launch of our Hollywood Bureau back in 2021, there's a lot to not be happy about, but every so often there's some great representation. And when that comes out, we want to celebrate. And I am delighted to invite our guest on today. He is a New York Post reporter, a second time author, and he's debuting a new book now called Goyhood uh, with Simon & Schuster. His name is Ruvain Fenton. And uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you. The pleasure is all mine. So, um, Tell us before we get into the book that has a pretty, uh, you know, provocative and Jewish title. Um, what is your Jewish background growing up uh, with the name Ruvain? I'm guessing you grew up in a more observant background. Uh, yeah, yeah. In a sense, actually, what happened was my my parents, we were, we were not really observant growing up until I was around the age of 12, although my mother in particular had a deeply Jewish, uh, just call it a sense, uh, a desire to be um, observant. Uh, but wasn't in any case, uh, you know, we were traditional uh, and she, uh, you know, she gave me that name because, you know, she, she, as I say, loved, loved Judaism, loved anything Jewish. And when I was around the age of 12, we, we became observant uh, fairly quickly, actually. Um, and then, and then from then on, it was kind of a full, full speed ahead into observant life, uh, which was rather jarring for me at age 12, but that's a whole story in and of itself. But but yeah, I mean, I have a, a deeply uh, religious background, that's for sure. And where did you grow up? What community? I grew up in Lexington, Massachusetts. We went to Chabad over there. That was actually the the organization through which my parents became observant. And then after that, I went to an Orthodox uh, school, Maimonides, which is in uh, just outside of Boston. Went to Yeshiva University. And um, so, you know, my schooling is, uh, mo uh, most of my life has been uh, Jewish. You know, it was interesting you say it's a whole other story um, to kind of discover this very new and Jewish life um, kind of at a coming of age point. But it sounds maybe a little bit like what your book is about, a little bit different, but maybe also a little bit the same. Um, so can you give us a brief synopsis on what Goyhood is about? Uh, Goyhood is the story of a, of a deeply religious uh, observant Jew who's, who's deeply enmeshed in the yeshiva world of Brooklyn who discovers uh, in middle age that he's not actually a Jew. There was a, an error, which is, a, that's the whole backstory, but there was basically, he discovers he's not really a Jew. And then what he ends up reuniting with his twin brother, who's not religious at all. And the two of them go on this road trip, which was sort of a journey of self-discovery where they end up uh, driving through the deep South and getting all into all kinds of madcap adventures along the way. And along the way, they both, uh, end up kind of transforming um, as they learn a lot more about themselves and about each other and about, you know, certain life questions that that, that they tackle that uh, ends up transforming them as people. Did the lack of positive representation or authentic representation of Orthodox Jews motivate you to try to tell a better story? I mean, absolutely. I felt like I was in a unique position here because, you know, professionally, I'm a journalist. Um, I, I know how to write and I, I'm, I guess I'm kind of... Mm, I, I would say worldly in a sense, not to play myself up too much, but I have a, a, a good general knowledge of things. Um, at the same time, I have this deeply religious background. So I, I really do walk this tightrope between two worlds um, that I don't think a lot of people uh, do to the degree that I do. And so I felt like I have an opportunity here to write a book, tell a story that actually portrays the religious community and communities um, uh, in the Jewish world um, accurately. I was really going for accuracy. I went out of my way um, and I actually even kind of had a fact check, if you will, with a, with my brother who was a, who was a rabbi uh, to have him look at it and tell me like, does this ring true to you to all these, all these observations and all these facts that I bring up in the story ring true. And he, uh, he, he gave it the, uh, the OU. He, 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 uh, and he, he said, yes, he said, you, he, there were a few things that he changed with me. But other than that, uh, yeah, he, he thought I got it right. Are there any, you know, stereotypes that you've seen that you think that your Orthodox characters in this book defy? 
Abs yeah, for sure. I mean, I mean, fundamentally, Orthodox Jews are, are fundamentally people um, in the sense of, you know, our drives and our desires and our and our daily habits are mostly just, you know, conform to that of just society at large. And, um, we, you know, when you do see uh, Jews portrayed in mass media, um, you know, we, we've all had this experience, anybody who's Orthodox in particular, or really anybody who's Jewish, who's, who's watched, seen films and, and read books. I mean, I mean, there's a lot of eye rolling going on because we know like they're just not getting it right. They're, they're just overplaying cer certain aspects of who, you, who we are. Um, you know, uh, the, the, all these kind of stereotypes about our fussiness and about our, um, just, just all the different stereotypes uh, that, that are out there about Jews that, um, uh, that I think give a false representation of who we are and ultimately do lead to, to anti-Semitic situations. Whereas, I mean, fundamentally, we're just normal people. A hundred percent. I was not raised observant and I only knew Orthodox Jews through what media told me. And when I got to actually meet some as a teenager, what I came to understand was that News media captured the crooks, creeps, and extremists of Orthodox society, and fictional media captured the most salacious stories. And in fact, most Orthodox Jews, you know, enjoy their lives, are proud of who they are, and have normal, normal human struggles and foibles. Um, and you know, hopefully, um, their lifestyle and identity brings them extra pride and extra joy. And, you know, I think what's frustrating for me is that there has been this move for accuracy and authenticity for every other group. There's been this, um, you know, sort of push to lean in to celebrate who you are. Um, and besides the, you know, extremism that's featured and the judgmentalism that's featured, another popular uh, tale is the, the narrative of the Orthodox Jew leaving. Um, and that's what I love about your character is going back. Can we give it away? Is he, is he, does he decide to become Jewish after he finds out he's not Jewish? We give away the ending or is that like a, a uh, plot spoiler? Uh, uh, no, let's, let, let's not spoil it. But I mean, ultimately, you know, the, the book does have a, a let's call it a, a satisfying ending. You know, I mean, you know. I, so I, I appreciate that because, you know, this notion of um, everybody else leaning in and, Orthodox Jews needing to run away. Mm -hmm. um, it's an interesting dynamic. Um, you know, I give it uh, the example I call sort of like the Luca model. Luca is um, a Pixar movie of a sea monster um, in the sea. He becomes a boy in dry land. And the whole time he's struggling with this part of his identity, a sea monster that nobody loves in real life. By the end of the movie, all the townspeople come to love him for being a sea monster. He comes to love himself for that part of himself. And then mm. the audience members are also some, supposed to love the parts of themselves that don't fit into society. And that's sort of the model that everybody, every other minority group is sort of meant to look at. Love the parts of yourself that don't fit in. For the Jew, um, we get complete sort of Hollywood uh, congratulates us when we move away from the parts that don't fit in. And so... Um, I very much appreciate that um, your character, as far as I can tell, maybe seems to want to be Jewish, even though he doesn't have to be. You know, I'm so glad, by the way, that you verbalized it just that way, because that was actually you did a better job than I would have done. And 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 you just read my mind in terms of um, th there's this there's this impulse that so many of us Jews have that oh no we we need to blend it with the Gentiles because there's something wrong with us. And and uh, as you see, I mean, I've got to keep on right now. Um, I, I often don't wear one, particularly when professionally, because again, there there is that uh, need that 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 so many of us feel like we don't feel like we're accepted, and it's it's a funny thing. I'm just going to mention offhand that like um, I, I've noticed, um, and I actually see this as a positive thing, that you know, particularly when I'm in Manhattan, I mean, the the, the number of women I see with um, with with like Muslim head coverings now has just it, it's got it's got to be it's it's just in the past just couple of years it's gone up incredible amounts and i and i'm fairly certain that many of these women were not comfortable wearing it but again there's this uh there's this push among minorities be yourself be yourself be yourself you're, you're beautiful how you are and that's just true yep. across the board um ex except for us so i will tell you my husband was at um a a work uh you know a weekend and there was an I think an Asian professor from NYU giving a lecture about covering and he talked about how people used to cover when they came to work they would straighten their hair change their name to something more you know sort of American um do different things to kind of become more white and he said 
now everybody is leaning in, being out, being proud. And as my husband sat there in the meeting, he wasn't wearing a yarmulke. And he was like, hmm, like, have the Jews followed? And I think he feels a similar type of, you know, question burden. He's a lawyer. What will the client think? What will the judge think? Will he be able to represent them, you know, in a fair way if people see him with that label? I'll tell you something I learned from one of the history professors that we had on the podcast. Um, what he explained was that um, when Napoleon offered emancipation to the Jews during the Enlightenment, um, it wasn't without conditions. It was basically, we'll free you from the uh, the ghetto, but you're only allowed to mix in Gentile spaces if you tamp down on your Jewishness and you tamp down on your connection to your land. Um, and so that's how a lot of Jewish people feel comfortable mixing in non-Jewish spaces. And the truth is that the name of our organization, Jew in the City, I've come to realize over time, is really a response to that mentality from the Haskalah, from the Enlightenment, be a Jew in the home, not on the street. Jew in the City is great. be Jewish everywhere, wear that pride everywhere you go. Um, and something mm -hmm. that I mentioned at our Sundance panel this year was that if you want to say a dirty word about Jews, um, you could say the word Orthodox Jew or Zionist. Yeah. If you want to make the words even dirtier, say Hasidic Jew or say settler. And so kind of the more you lean into those topics of Jewish heritage and land, the worse kind of Jew you get. The more that you kind of shy away from that, the more acceptable that you can be in um, in these spaces. And so since I mentioned Israel, um, and we haven't mentioned it yet, and we usually mention it a lot since October, um, how do you see this book fitting into sort of the importance or sort of the where we are as a society and the zeitgeist in our post-October 7th world? So October 7th world. Post-October has changed everything. So my, my book doesn't deal with Israel. Um, why that is, is because I guess Israel just wasn't particularly relevant to the narrative, although it, it is an underlying thing all the time. But I think what's happened was in the post-October post -October 7th world, so many Jews have come to realize that, you know, it, it used to be a kind of common knowledge or, or commonly said and almost accepted by many that, oh, you know, uh, be, being anti-Semitic is not the same as being anti-Israel, okay? But it's just, I mean, it, it's so plainly obvious to so many of us now that 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 the two are, are intertwined to the point that they're one. So to me, you know, writing this book, which I'm just gonna hold up real quick, Goyhood, my novel, um, well, even though it doesn't deal with Israel, it's a deeply Jewish novel. And I actually had a whole piece in the New York Post that ran a couple of weeks ago, an editorial that gets into the whole issue of being a Jewish writer at a, in the post-October 7th world and how there are these campaigns across the board to basically cancel and ruin and put out of business uh, but not only Jewish writers, but also uh, non-Jewish writers who have, who have ever even once posted on Instagram something favorable to Israel or even uh, not critical to Israel. Um, and so you, you you just see how, um, you know, there, there was this notorious viral list of authors that, that went run around the web, maybe you saw it, that basically listed almost just about 200 authors, mostly Jewish, uh, do you know, like like begging uh, people, may, trying to go viral, beg people, don't don't buy these authors books because they're because they're uh, they're racist Zionists. And meanwhile, they're they're ninety percent of them are Jewish, and um, I mean, when you read this list, your blood goes cold because you you feel like you're you're back in a situation where it's like actual persecution going on. So there's that whole component of of of, of being a of, of putting out something that's deeply Jewish. You have this awareness, like, oh my God, I'm exposing myself as a Jew. I'm 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 uh, what's the word? Um, I'm, I'm, it's I'm, a vulnerability. I'm, I'm not undercover anymore. You know, you know, I think the other thing um, about kind of how your book relates to the world right now is that I think a journey of sort of like self-discovery or sort of like um, and I imagine the metaphor of the drive, the journey is also the journey back to self and sort of to, you know, reconnect with the Jewish roots. Mm -hmm. I think that's what's happening to so many assimilated Jews. I think that um, there were so many Jews that thought like it's over. We got past it. You know, we're American. We don't need those old traditions or laws. You know, we, we've we made it now. And I think um, really all the institutions that Jews have relied on, which you touched on here, but also add in academia and political parties, like all the places that Jews have spent 
decades and decades building and being leaders in, um, they are starting to alienate Jews. And as I think we feel less and less comfortable in other spaces, where else do you return to but to self? Um, and, you know, I'm looking at this, really, I'm clinging to my faith now more than ever, because um, I don't know how else to explain the state of the world. Um, you know, Nazism, it was a gross <laughs> ideology, and they took certain types of people and said they were subhuman and they had to be exterminated. But the fact that the majority of the people that are sort of front and center in this new isolating of Jews are the people that are all about inclusivity, all about diversity, all about lifting up the persecuted. The fact that we went from the parasites and, you know, the tuberculosis of the races to now the white colonialist uh, oppressors, and they don't know that we're the same people and have been, you know, harmed and marginalized in every place we've ever lived. Um, it defies logic. I think there's just so many people now that don't know kind of what to do. And so I think there are so many Jews now that are making this journey back to their roots. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, the the when you, when you get into the discussion of the hypocrisy, it can literally drive you mad because it's so frustrating, the blatantness of it and the fact that it's so accepted and it's so embraced by just mainstream um, organizations that just, the you know, media, frankly, media organizations that just embrace this hypocrisy. Yes, yes, you know, and and, and keep pushing and validating it. This, this, is, this is validated hypocrisy. And in times like this, absolutely, um, and look at our history, our thousands of years long history in our in our most desperate times, in our most difficult times. That's when we all come. And this is this is just human nature. When you're in uh, in dark times, you come together. When when you're yeah. in easy times, you grow apart. That's just how it is. You become complacent. So I, I think we certainly I and, and and many, many, many Jews before October 7th and definitely in Israel is really gotten very comfortable. You know, um, I think they'd reach some kind of plateau where they're like, OK, maybe we can kind of live like this, where we have the situation where we know there are terrorists on the other side. Um, but I don't know, somehow this is working out and some uh, some imperfect peace. But but no, it, it proved not to be the case. And there's no imperfect peace there, nor in America. And and now I'm seeing it everywhere. Patriotism, religiosity, but like Jews being Jews more than they have been in a long, long time. Um, I'll tell you, in terms of people becoming complacent in Israel, the night of October 6th, it was a two-day, you know, Yom Tov, and I was reading the Houses of Worship column in the Wall Street Journal, and the article, or maybe it was right below it, it was an op-ed about the Yom Kippur War, and I thought, why are you writing about Yom Kippur now? That was a couple of weeks ago, and I realized, ah, it's the 50th anniversary, and suddenly I'm reading about how much more deadly and sort of existentially threatening this war was than I quite understood. But the article ended with this hopeful note of, but now we're past this time and we'll just use our technology to keep advancing forward. And I went to sleep sort of mourning um, a war that I hadn't quite understood the gravity of from 50 years earlier, uh, but sort of fell asleep with the note that we're in a good place now only to have my husband come home from shul the next day and say Israel is under attack. You know, another thing, I keep thinking about sort of different applications of your book and where we are right now. There's a certain guilt in having children. Maybe it came across my mind or maybe there is just some Jewish guilt, the stereotype of I brought children into the world that are part of a hated people. Um, and I verbalized this recently to my son. Um, and I said, you know, like kind of sorry, <laughs> sorry that we brought you into this hated people. Um, and he said, don't worry, it was worth it. So, um, you know, I think um, that feeling of would you choose it anyway, um, if you didn't have to, would you choose to be a part of the Jewish people? Um, I know I would, even with the challenges and the fears. Um, and I'm imagining that your book, you know, sort of uh, tackles those questions. And I think that's such a meaningful question. And I think it's something that so many Jews are thinking about right now as well. Oh, my God. And I, and I guarantee you that... Uh... I wouldn't be surprised if 100%, without exception, said yes, um, because again, I mean, there's that there's that deep sense of Jewishness, there's this Jewish pride. And by the way, I wasn't, I happened to be in Israel a week and a half ago, two weeks ago, 
And oh my God, the the uh, I, I got such a good vibe there in terms of you know despite all the depression and anxiety over these issues, the patriotism, the the love of country is like nothing. I and I've and I've been to Israel many times. I was on a work trip, and I have not seen this type of just um, patriotism. E even even uh, even opposing groups. Uh, they, you know, there's this whole uh, debate right now. Um, involving you know, the activists are getting involved about about the whole hostages crisis how to handle it and it but 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 both sets of marchers march with israeli flags um and and again i mean i i really just it's an overwhelming sense of unity um someone in israel might disagree with me but that's that was the vibe that i got absolutely yeah we were there for pesach and we saw stickers everywhere uh you know talking about unity and you know through unity, uh, we will uh, survive, we will, uh, you know, flourish. Um, it was definitely very inspiring to see that. And then also going into the holiday of Shavuos um, at the Israel Day Parade this week, the signs everywhere, Amachad, uh, Levachad, that, you know, one nation, one heart is very similar to the language from the Torah about Ishachad, um, ish um, that, you know, the Jewish people were like one man with one heart. Um, it seems like we are sticking to where we need to be um, as we, you know, once again, get ready for receiving the Torah. And I, I hope that will only lead to good things. Um, have you gotten any feedback from non-Orthodox Jews or non-Jews who have read your book? It's funny you mention that because I was I keep uh, telling my, my my mother can't believe it, but uh, you know a lot of people have reviewed it and read it, and um, I, I keep telling my mother it's like Jew and Gentile alike. Uh, for the most part, uh, really enjoyed the book because it's as I said, I did, I did walk that that tightrope. I mean, my my publisher is, is not a Jewish public. It's not a not a Jewish publishing house. This is a secular novel, um, despite the name and 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 all the Jewishness in it. It's technically, you know, just it's this this is not a a a, a Jewish printing house, and it's not a it's not what you might call a from book. Um, and so in in that sense, um, it it I. I really walked that line to make it truly enjoyable for for everyone, um, and 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 people who are not Jewish or not religious, they they just enjoy it because I, I I did a good job. You know, I just told a good entertaining story that opens up some thought provoking questions. But I mean, essentially, it's it's a work of entertainment. I mean, you know, at the very least, and and no one would deny that. There would be a couple of bad reviews, but I mean, mostly like overwhelmingly very good ones. Well, you are and a Zionist. Um, I said you are Zionist. So. No, I, so so far I've managed to escape that, but uh, but I don't know uh, how, how much longer I can, especially because you know I did that New York Post piece. But so far I haven't made any list, and like no nobody's review bombed review bombed my Amazon. We'll see, we'll see. I mean maybe maybe because I have a little bit of a what do you call it a step up by 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 being somewhat of a public figure in terms of working, you know, being a journalist. Uh, maybe that gives me some power of some kind. I'm not sure, but so it far so. Did anyone express that the book changed their perceptions of the community based on other, you know, media that they'd consumed? Did anybody say that? No, but I think, you know, but I think that that's not necessarily a conscious thing for people. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, my hope is that they won't even necessarily realize it. But mm -hmm. after they read this book, then then they're going to think like, you know, it, it, you know, just just a, to, just a quick tangent, but not really a tangent. I mean, I, I've had conversations with with with. Uh, non-Jews and, and 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 not you know unaffiliated Jews you know we'll, we'll we'll be in like a Hasidic neighborhood in Williamsburg let's say a colleague of mine that I'm working with we're we'll being in Williamsburg and like they're so annoyed with these people just because like look at them look 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 how they act look look how they treat women you know and again all these stereotypes that aren't even true like women are like I think as far as I know, just like totally prized and and beloved, and and many of them are CEOs in their own right. You wouldn't even know it from looking at them, okay. But that being said, it's like I have to explain to to colleagues like you've got the totally wrong idea about these people. I'm hoping a book like this, they read it, and it's like it, well, again, it won't even be, it won't even be a conscious thing, but it'll kind of reset a reality inside them, and and or at least in some way, just just notched a little bit towards the center of of, of the truth. Mm -hmm. uh, Look, I'll tell you, I think the other similarity um, when you compare both storylines of sort of, you know, religious Jews and Zionists is that these are groups that are both dehumanized. Um, and again, moving the needle towards showing more humanity and, you know, the things that all people relate to and have in common. I mean, that's ultimately how Jews become more accepted and more safe because, 
when uh, you know a community is dehumanized, it becomes so much more easily to afflict them with violence um, because you can harm something that you know isn't at your level. So yeah. you know, I think a book like this is so important, even more important now than ever. And the most attacked groups always and continuing to be now are the visible Jews, um, the ones that are wearing, and it's also people speaking Hebrew, obviously people speaking Hebrew are being attacked and people wearing Jewish dars, but you know, the Haredi community is the most visible. They kind of wear their Jewishness in the most public way and that puts the biggest targets on their backs. Um, and so I think in terms of, you know, those uh, misconceptions or stereotypes being uh, broken down, uh, it's the most important to do for that community. Be the change you want to see in the world, as Gandhi said. You know, just just be the you know just be, and 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 you'll see change. So hopefully that's what that could be applied to my book in some small but hopefully meaningful way. Excellent. And any plans for any more books? You know, covering the Orthodox community after this, or is it? Hey, I just finished a book. Leave me alone. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Well, the, the yes and no. I, I I'm deep I'm deeply into a new novel, which happens to not be a Jewish novel. Um, it's just it's a it's 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 just a novel. Um, but because you know this is this is you know kind of my passion. But that being said, I mean I'm really curious to see the you know the, this book does. Um, I, I do leave it open for a sequel, okay? And okay. so, it, you know, depending on what does, if people, if people demand it, I would be open to writing one and continuing the adventures of my two twin brother protagonists who could not be more different, but are ultimately the same. Love it. And what I mentioned when we first got on is that when we talk to studios and producers, um, they always want to know, is there a book that we could turn into a movie? That's always a very easy way to bring a story to the screen. So like I said, I always appreciate when there's something great that we can turn to. So um, pick up your copy of Goyhood by Ruvain Fenton. Um, and uh, let's hope that you don't get too famous to get onto one of the lists, but famous enough to sell out a lot of books. Allison, what a pleasure. Thank you so much. I really had fun. Yeah, thanks so much. Great talking to you. And thanks for listening. You can catch us same time, same place next week. Bye-bye.